Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Hard Nine Podcast. Today is July the 21st, God's great year of 2024. And as you can notice, there are more than just Caleb and my face on the screen. Uh, that makes means that this podcast is going to be dramatically better. Uh, we are super pumped to have two of our all-time favorites, Kyle Reese and Kareem here. Thank you guys for joining us. But more importantly, it's just great to see you all again. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay, so um, I think we want to start with, we kind of have a, we almost never have like any order to this podcast, like almost never. And I think that kind of drives the other noble a little crazy at times. But today we have a little more scripted, but it'll never, it won't stay that way. It'll it's never stay that scripted. way. It's not scripted. No, you, you, well, you fuck up it was script make, already. You messed it, it up was, already. It was, right. We're already off of it. And it was to make <laughs> Caleb happy. That's the only reason we have it. But mm -hmm. we do want to start. Give us, I, we'd like to hear your guys, because everybody hears from us a lot. Give us your guys current state of the Cardinals, where they are right now after taking two of three in Atlanta, uh, even though we did not face any of their good pitchers. Caleb, what are you drinking? Are you, do you have another dollar drink from a gas station or McDonald's? Or <laughs> no, something? it's just water in a big ass cup. Okay. All right. Yeah, no, agree. and it was from McDonald's, not a gas station, by the okay, way. Okay. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you disrespect my McDonald's coffees. <laughs> Uh, Kareem, please handle the question. I don't have anything to say. <laughs> yeah, I think the Cardinals are you know playing well. I, this team seems like they're going to make the playoffs, which is uh, something I wasn't overly confident about entering the year. So, hey, that's something. Um, so <laughs> I don't have much to add other than that. I think we're in a good spot right now. And hopefully by the end of the year, we can make the playoffs. Will Alec Burleson get MVP votes? That's the question. When he goes 30 and 100, <laughs> he's been awesome. So I know you guys both were big um, Burleson supporters. Like, give the guy time. He's going to hit at some point, um, which is how most people that watch him in the minor leagues felt. Are you surprised at how much he's really come on here? Because he's turning into like a legitimate middle of the order bat and not just a Cardinals middle of the order bat that's there because the other guys aren't good. But he's like a legitimate middle of the order bat right now. Uh, you know, I, if you would have told me that he has like 30, 100 potential, as arbitrary as the runs batted in number is, uh, I probably would have said that that's an exaggeration. I, I probably would have tried to pump the brakes on that a little bit. I remember specifically in spring training where, like, everybody was talking about Jordan Walker getting a hit off, of, like, Justin Verlander or Garrett Cole in, like, week two a couple of years ago. And it was a first-pitch fastball he got a hit. And I remember later on in that, that week, um, Alec Burleson went up against – like DeGrom and Scherzer or something like that and got back-to-back -back hits off of them. Uh, and thinking back to his time in the minors and just remembering like, all right, every high velocity, nasty stuff pitcher that he went up against, he'd battle with. Now he might not always get a hit. He might strike out, but it didn't matter if the pitch was in the zone or outside of the zone, specifically up and down in the zone. He would always battle and battle and battle. So I remember specifically in 2022 writing his write-up and saying that this is a major league bat. This is a major league everyday player. It's just a matter of how he adapts out in the outfield and, uh, you know, what what surrounds him. So I always viewed him as an everyday player that's a complement piece, not the offensive catalyst of a lineup. And now, right now, at this very moment, and for the last two months, which has driven the Cardinals from being a, out of a playoff picture to a playoff contender – Alec Burleson is absolutely the offensive catalyst of the team. So I would not say that that was something I ever thought would happen, but I did think that he was an everyday major leaguer with the chance to, uh, you know, cause he swings so much because he's so aggressive and he has such great bat to ball skills. It was just a matter of how much luck he had with the contact that he made. Yeah. So I ac ac echo Kyle's sentiments. Uh, it's really impressive to see what he was able to do early, earlier in his career against those tough pitchers and things like that. And I didn't expect him to, you know, fl flourish into what he is entirely, uh, like currently on the major league team. Um, just because you never know with guys that are overly aggressive, especially against going, going up against higher level of competition. But, um, but yeah, Burleson has been very impressive. He's a guy that makes a ton of contact and we've seen the power, uh, start to come this year as well. And yeah, it's been very impressive to watch. The thing that I love about him too, and we don't, we didn't even plan this one, but I love Alec Burleson. Um, is I love every time he's every time he's up, 
you feel like he has a chance. Like he might, like you said, he might strike out. He might, you know, he might be over aggressive on a pitch at his ankles that he hits right to the second baseman and makes me want to scream at the top of my lungs. But he has a chance to do something good. And that's that's what I like about him. Even though he lined down to a double play with first and third and extras the other day. Like other things like that happen too. It's like, that's just ridiculous. Like what can he do about that? You know, I I think entering this, this season, as we talk about prospects, like that was my concern with Thomas to JC, as you, as you talk about, like when you can make a lot of contact outside of the zone, that's a positive until you're making too much contact outside of the zone. Uh, this has kind of been my concern with Jack Cag all along in the draft is yeah, he, he makes hard contact and it's monstrous and it's loud and it's a whole different thing. But as you work your way up the minor league ladder, that that's kind of a liability sometimes. And I bring up to JC, I bring up Cags and the Burleson conversation. Cause I do think that in one year, there's a reality that Alec Burleson is only hitting 250 with 14, you know, 12 to 14 home runs and, you know, maybe not driving in runs because there's going to be luck there with aggressive, aggressive swingers, aggressive hitters. And then the next year he might be the person that he is this year. I, he, I think that if you we're, we're expecting this to kind of be like um, anything other than a bit of a whirlwind roller coaster, I'm not saying huge highs and huge lows, like that, that is the danger to Kareem's point, to your point, Caleb of having guys who are this aggressive. You just never know how consistent it's going to be. Let's let's switch a little bit because I think the thing that we really want to talk about, well, there's a lot but with you guys because we haven't seen you all in a while. But obviously Sunday was the, I mean, the big to-do uh, with the draft. And I think we've all seen Kareem's reaction when J.J. Weatherholt was the pick because, <laughs> hey, last year, you t- last year you told me it was Chase Davis and you nailed it. Evidently, the year before, you also nailed that one. I should give you props on that as well. But then Perfect. you told me it was going to be J.J. Weatherholt. And I did not – I'll be honest. I mean, consensus coming into this season, uh, he was probably the number one pick. I mean, he was in that conversation. Let's just say that. And then all of a sudden for him – like, I did not think he dropped a seven. And then it just kept happening. Cam and I were at a bar watching the draft, and it just kept happening, and it just kept happening. And so I want to hear from you guys on the newest – number one draft pick of the Cardinals because it's been since what 1998 since the Cardinals have had a top 10 draft pick I think something like that so that's a long time so yeah JJ Weatherholt's a guy that is really impressive like this is a guy that makes a ton of contact uh hits the sweet spot a lot uh hits line drives to all the fields and yeah early in the draft process I really fell in love with him and I heard from from people that the Cardinals really love this guy um early in the process and uh, if there was any possibility of him being there at seven, I knew the Cardinals would um, consider picking him. So I, I really love that, you know, the, the, the Guardians ended up going with with Bazzano because it made this all possible. But um, but yeah, Weatherholt's a very good talent. I think the best prospect the Cardinals have had since since uh, Jordan Walker. And, and yeah, it's very, very, um, very good news for Cardinals fans uh, getting a prospect of this caliber early in the draft. Cause I mean, the Cardinals have never picked in the top 10 since, since 1998. And to get a prospect of this caliber, someone that was projected to go first overall entering the season, like it, it's, it's remarkable. I'm, I'm fascinated to, uh, you know, watch Weatherholt's development over the next few years and what, what this looks like in the major leagues. But yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that the Cardinals were able to get Weatherholt. Yeah, I same thing here. You know, uh, I think I think about the Oakland Athletics is what I think about. And I think about the Oakland Athletics a lot now and nothing against Nick Kurtz. But thank God the Oakland Athletics or the Sacramento Athletics or the Las Vegas Athletics, whoever they're going to be whenever they decide to be it. uh, Thank God that they do the things that they do, because I think we're going to look back on that. We're going to look in maybe even the Royals with uh, Caglione at at six. But specifically that Kurtz pick, I think we're going to look back and we're going to realize that that along again with what Kareem said, Bazana going to the Guardians. Uh, those were the two big dominoes that changed, that allowed the Cardinals to draft Weatherholt, in my opinion. And thank God for it. Uh, you know, really, the Cardinals have a guy, and, you know, I, we'll get into the perspective of it all here in a second, but um, I love him. I just love everything he does. I love how he goes about it. I, I love every every little aspect of his game. You know, I don't necessarily think that this is Wyatt Langford, you know, uh, just to kind of compare year after year, just to give people like a mindset, like, let's not start talking about in one year or on opening day, uh, uh, J.J. Weatherholt being major league ready, because 
he, you know, he probably isn't the same prospect from a draft standpoint that Wyatt Langford was. And look at Wyatt Langford. Sure, he's holding his own with the Rangers, but 250, 313 with like six home runs. Like, no, that kid needed still needs time to develop. So I, I, as the person who is always pumping the brakes on development, I want to say as impressive as this young man is, uh, let's let's talk about the 18 months of it all with him. And then next spring, and not this coming spring, the spring ending to 2026, a major league option if he continues to make strides because the minor leagues are a grind by the time you get to double a everything changes in double a um and the last thing you need to do is push him you, you need to be really delicate and deliberate with what you do here because of how valuable of an asset and the potential that he has but all of the things that kareem says like he is as ideal as you could want if you're the cardinals even more so than bazana because of how he uses the whole field you know the, the, he doesn't have that natural. He's not going to do the pull power thing necessarily all the time that Bazana does. But he's he's probably a more natural, like traditional hitter, and that's Cardinals to a T. What they're looking for, and probably what's going to work better in their system with their coaches, anyways. I, I was also I'm curious, not to knock. I don't this. I don't think this is a knock on him. I just want to know if you guys have any concern about this at all. Is it his soft tissue injuries that he's had over the last couple of years? And I know he had one that should have come out for a while. That to me is. A, I'll just give my real quick. I don't know. Like it could continue to be like new bar where he gets a bunch of weird injuries or he could never have another one. Um, but I'm glad it didn't scare the Cardinals off. It was, is there anything like you guys see it when you're drafting a guy this young and this raw that you're like, Oh, there's just don't even worry yourself about that because injuries are weird anyway. Yeah. I'm, I think, I'm definitely worried, worried about the hamstring, but we'll see, you know, I it's a, with it being a recurring injury, of course you worry about it a little bit more, but you know, I like that they went with talent. I like that they took the chance because oftentimes it's not until later rounds, once you get past the fifth round or maybe like third round on where they're willing to take a chance with an injury. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think there's some concerns, which is, you know, the soft tissue injuries and the, the re aggravation of, of it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I still think it's worth a shot to, you know, draft this guy and the, the talent he has and, Maybe it was just two separate occurrences of hamstring injuries, and this isn't going to be something that's going to affect him down the road. But, but yeah, I still think it's, uh, I don't think it's enough of a concern to really, um, you know, like fault the pick at all. You know, yeah. like this yeah. is still a talented guy and deserves every bit of the selection. And the funny part about it, not, I mean, I don't know about funny, but if he didn't have those injuries that would be the concern, they wouldn't have gotten him. Like he wouldn't, he probably yeah. would have been in the top three. Like he was already maybe going number one if the Guardians win the underslot anyway, um, which obviously they didn't. But I, I think that was interesting because some, some people were like, well, his injuries, I'm like, yeah, well, if he didn't have them, he probably would have gone first overall. So um, early second overall. But. Do, so one of the things with him is, and we've seen with this Cardinals organization, again, you guys, I always go to you guys because you know way more about it than I do. However, the, the lack of depth at shortstop in the organization has not been – like it's not there if, for the most part, as far as I know. Um, do you think that this is a, a guy they're going to keep it shortstop and just let him develop there? And then if there does become a need at the big league level, then maybe you see a position change. Uh, it feels like a lot of people, the the Twitter GMs out there, right, who do feel like, oh, we're gonna he's going to start at second base for Palm Beach or center field. Like we needed a pitcher. Could, that could be <laughs> right. That right. <laughs> that could be bingo. Why, Why did they not take savage? the seventh worst pitcher? But yeah. Um, do you think that's one of those things where they're just going to let him develop through the minor leagues and then just let that go from there? And, and from there, they'll make an assessment on if they need him at a different spot. I think the Cardinals should continue to develop him at shortstop as long as possible, because that's where he's going to have more value. It being a more, you know, uh, valuable position rather than second base. And he really handled him. He handled his own there this year at West Virginia. And although he doesn't have the strongest arm, he was plenty good there. And the Cardinals should continue to develop him at short. Um, even with a guy like Mason Wynn at short in the big league club, I don't think they should even consider, like, I don't think that should be in their uh, minds, you know, when they're developing this guy right now. You could obviously move him to second base anytime, all right? But I think it's important for him to get the reps at shortstop. And if he can play shortstop, that's just going to add to his value. So, yeah, Agreed. continue to continue to um develop this guy's a shortstop for sure i'm sure that uh, you know i uh i think his arm strength is a little the the lack of it is a little overblown i went back and i watched a bunch like it's it's not it's not gonna wow you at all you know it's it's not a top tier arm but he he can make every throw that you need him to make 
So like this is where it gets fun is, yes, you you keep him at short as long as possible. You know he's going to handle second. You don't have to worry about that. I'll be honest. If you're going to throw him in, if you have to, say that things get weird and on a last minute you got to throw him in left or in center or in right, he's probably going to be fine there. Yeah. That's where the Brendan Donovan of it all comes in. It's not about what he does at the plate, although there is some – but it's the ability to like, all right, you don't have to worry about him if you have to bring him up to the majors and he makes his debut as a left fielder, although he's never played left field. That's the type of athlete he is, and that's the positive. But what you have here, as people keep asking, like I'm sure Kareem gets this a lot, like where are they going to start Weatherholt? Well, my my preference would be that they start Weatherholt in 2025, and they start from day one. Right now, he's he's down in Jupiter working on arm strength, working on arm strength, working on footwork. Doesn't even see a major league at bat this year. He you know uh, he doesn't need to. Like again, he he missed a lot of time earlier in the year or a minor league at bat. Missed a lot of time at, at West Virginia early on in the year, but you know, just just get him in the process, get him going. Maybe at the end of you know in September, you you get him into a couple games at Peoria or Palm Beach, and you just let it happen. And then next year, you start him off at Palm or at Peoria, and you as your everyday shortstop, and you let it work from there. That's what I would do. And I love that, point, by the way. And, and, and to your point, like if Weatherhill becomes like an incredible defensive shortstop, right? Like he develops into that, and you have him and Mason win. That's a great thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it's better than having Paul DeYoung and Thomas Ajaces saying, oh, maybe they can play short. It's better to have a shortstop that you know can play second because he played second base in college anyway. So, yeah. like, it's not – also, short and second, there are different positions, obviously. But I don't think I'd ever be worried about a shortstop moving to second base in a pinch if he needed to. That's not yeah. something I'd concern myself with. Yeah. Um, I also – okay, another prospect. As I mean, I know a lot of people like the third-round pick, Brian Holiday. That's a lot of people's – um a pick a lot of people talked about. Do you guys like this pick? I've seen various takes. I know Kyle had one immediately, and some people like his fastball. Like, did you like that pick at all? I know there were some interesting people available there, and they took him. We are yeah, talking about know. Matt Holiday's other kid, right? Yes, we have Matt Holiday's other kid that he spells okay. with a different – with one L. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to get L. that out there <laughs> to make sure that people knew that that was the fact. So Exactly, yeah. Okay. Uh, he, he So his, his – Matt Holiday's – a mistress also has the last name Holiday. Extra she only spells, L. Just spell differently. Exactly, and this is this is his son with the mistress. Um, I think I think it happened in Louisiana. Just uh, you guys would know. You'll have to track her down, Mike. I trust that you have the connections that you'll be able to do the the lineage. I'm on test. it. I'm on it. <laughs> oh. uh, so I guess my thought is, you know, I uh, I'm just so tired of guys who have a 4.7 walk rate that the Cardinals fall in love with. Uh, regardless of some of the other shit that that they do and at pick 80 when you don't have a second round pick and pitching in your organization is kind of trash you have to take a chance and then what what also frustrates me is what happens a couple of rounds later when Braden Davis ends up being their next pitcher off the board and that is also more of the same kind of trash that has not benefited them at the major league level. Now, I do think Holiday has a potential to be a major league pitcher of some capacity in the same way that Michael McGreevy has the chance to be a major league pitcher in some capacity. You know, uh, they both have similar walk uh, walk rates and strikeout rates in college. Granted, one was in a conference that was weak and another one in a big a big conference. And we know that uh, Holiday's slider is better than any offering that um, uh, uh, McGreevy had coming out of college. And his fastball is probably better than anything that McGreevy had coming out of college. So that's a positive, but um, it also shows you how poor of a decision it was to draft Michael McGreevy in the first round. But it's just like, isn't there somebody else out there at that pick, and there was, that you can give that money to that actually offers like a tremendous amount of upside and still isn't safe? You know, that I, I like Holiday. And it's funny, if he's your fourth round pick, I'm like, I love that pick. You know, it, like, okay, that's a good pick. That is a really good pick. I see what they're doing here. I like it. Uh, but with the third round pick, without having a second round pick, it just feels like a whiff, even though I do like him, if that makes sense. Yeah, in recent years, it feels like the Cardinals love to target guys that are more control oriented with college performance early, early in the draft, like in their first first five picks, let's just say. And then with round seven to 10, they'll maybe take a chance of a starter that's injured, that has some quality stuff, and then 10 to rounds 10 through 20, they'll just take relievers. I've noticed that trend recently, like a few other names, uh, 
that have been taken recently in early rounds. Guys like Quinn Matthews, I know he's throwing 95 now, but he's more of a pitchability guy uh, coming out of college. Um, obviously, Michael McGreevy, um, another guy from last year, Jason Savakul. They just love all these guys that are more control, command-oriented guys early, and they want to teach these guys stuff as opposed to getting guys that have quality stuff but might not have perfect performance in college. Yeah. I have a question because I have a theory on why that is. Sorry. Do you think that's because like they pride themselves on being drafted and developed that they get really obsessive about making sure that in the first five to six rounds, they know they're getting a guy that's going to provide some sort of value at the big league level. And then later on, they're like, well, no one cares if our eighth round pick never makes it. So that's whatever. But the first couple of rounds are like, we need to make sure we get somebody that at the very least will be in the major leagues giving us something. I, for me, I think that it is a perfect personification of how the front office is ran in general, right? Like, you could either uh, you could either spend slot for Holiday or have to go over slot maybe for somebody who's more talented. And what you're doing is you're rolling the dice for Finley later in the rounds or a uh, 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 Christian Worley last year. And you don't have to pay as much for those guys if they just if you would have drafted them if they were healthy and you would have drafted them where they would normally go. So you, you just kind of take a jan a chance, but it's really kind of a minimal chance and if things go well they go well but like you said you can always fall back on well not many seventh rounders make it to the majors not many eighth rounders make it to the majors and you know i think that they like what they like and i don't know if that directive comes from the scouting staff if it comes from mr flores uh if it's if it's just like the group think or if mo is the one who's like hey uh we need to make sure that this guy has a floor of a major league debut but I, to me, like, I, I think it's all of those things in once. And to Kareem's point, like, the, the relievers, it's so funny. Like, I end up loving all the relievers that they take year after year after year in rounds 11 through 20. So it's really interesting. It's a really interesting dynamic how they how they do their thing. Is, is, is most kids uh, considering a Big 12 uh -huh. school and that's the only places they decided to take their family vacations this year? Where yeah. the big was the Big Twelve because it seems like we forgot that the SEC exists down here and does fucking dominate every single year. Um, and then there was the ACC, which also put four teams into a, uh, you know, into a College World Series. But we did nab a lot of guys from the from the Big Twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Zero answer. That tells me my question. Well, was spot to on. be fair, that wasn't really a question. You just said a bunch of stuff. Well, I, it's funny. well I did start it with did. So they, they like to draft guys who do well in one or two starts against teams in the SEC. Okay. Like, uh, you know, uh, Finley, who in a lot of ways reminds me of the same kind of stuff that they loved about Bryson Mounts. Uh, Finley uh, had an amazing start against Vanderbilt early in the, you know, early in his, like it was his last start before he ended up having to have Tommy John or whatever. And uh, he, he was awesome. They did the same thing with Mounts. Mounts had one amazing start against Vanderbilt and they lost their minds about it. Uh, they they convinced himself that his changeup was a major league pitch and his fastball was uh, capable as well and neither of them were. So it's it's interesting that you're you're right, especially the the Big Twelve. Uh, but they they do like pitchers who perform on a big stage, just like Holiday. Uh, like his his performance against Florida is, I would imagine, total guess, a catalyst for drafting him. And they like that. They they like that. And sure, they might not have drafted many SEC players. Other than um, uh, the outfielder from Alabama, Ian Putritz. <laughs> if you just say the Z all the way through, you can get away with it. Um, it, it but you're right. that It seems like that's that's their MO. Uh, talk to me about the kid from Vandy. You just brought up Vandy. So the, the other kid who ever I, – again, I will continue to go back to I respect you two more than just about anybody when it comes to these players. And I talked about this on the last podcast because I know the research and the time and the effort you put in. I'm not saying there aren't others who do on 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 the old X app. I'm saying I know what you do. So when you guys say something that perks my ears up because, I, I you know, I watch a lot of college baseball. I don't watch it all. But what do you, that seems to be the guy that a lot of people are like, oh, that could be a steal right there. And I cannot pronounce his name. But the kid from Vandy is what I'm going with. Yeah, so seventh round pick, Andrew Ditkanich, the fourth. I think that's how you pronounce it. And yeah, I think that, yeah, the fourth. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I think this is a guy that's got the most potential in terms of just pure stuff and, you know, ability. This is a guy that was, um, as a prepster, he was one of the top pitchers a couple of years ago in the high school class. Um, and he, 
there, there are some injury concerns. He's dealing with the Tommy John surgery right now. He's only pitched 17 innings in college. Um, pretty good results. The command's a little stop, spotty, but um, yeah, very, very high upside pitcher. He sits in the mid nineties with his fastball, gets a ton of spin. It's 19 inches of induced vertical break, which is above average. Um, he's got two nasty breaking balls, much like the fastball gets a ton of spin on them, kills the spin on his changeup. The raw stuff is just unbelievable with him. And um, we need to just see a little bit more, obviously 17 innings. We're just going off 17 innings of college, but the stuff's very impressive. And he has that high school pedigree as well. And I, I just think this is a guy that w we need to see healthy. And I hope the Cardinals develop him as a starter just because he, he has the makeup and, you know, the pitches to be a starter. It's not just the guy that's, you know, that's got crazy stuff. I think he's got the pitch ability there too. And, and yeah, that's the, that's really my thoughts with that pick. I, for me, I love like if first off, if there's a reliever, even a reliever question here, unless he has another arm injury and the Cardinals drafted him, they're stupid. And they, hopefully they didn't. Uh, hopefully that's not, you know, again, if he makes his, his minor league debut and he's a reliever for a half a season, you know, an inning here, two innings here, maybe three innings, kind of what they're doing with Zach Showalter now. I'm fine with that. You know, that that's one thing, but in his first full season after coming off of Tommy John, if he is not on the, the starter path, then this was a waste and it was stupid, but this, I, I don't think you could argue that this is the Cardinals' best draft pick outside of Weatherholt. He is a monster. And if you were telling me that uh, uh, this kid was just two years younger coming out of, of high school and they gave him 400K or 300K, whatever it was, to sign as a seventh round pick, you'd be like, all right, that is not, that might be the steal of the draft. And that's what this has the potential to be. And of course, the injury injury concerns there. But now this kid is a monster. This is this is real. You know, even comparing as we talked about Christian Worley from last year, um, uh, like this is a step. If Christian Worley is like a, a B minus prospect, then I would say that this young man is a full letter grade above Worley. Just to give you an idea of what his what his stock is, in my opinion, I I think that this was a great pick. And I think once he's healthy, we're going to have a lot of people, both Kareem and myself, who will be asking me, like, where did this guy come from? And we're going to have a lot to tell them. All right. I love to hear that. Now, Caleb did want to go round by round and really go through all the draft picks, um, not just Cardinals, not but true. NL Central not draft true. picks. I did talk him out of that. <laughs> so, you know, let's let's move on. What do you guys I... think about the Cubs 12th rounder? <laughs> so... I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, where I Bust. would like to start, and then we can go from there, and I'm going to let you guys go get into whatever you want. But the guy that, I mean, is the guy who is the guy that we've been talking about for years since we drafted him in 2020, it's Jordan Walker. Um, so I'm kind of, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on how, what what you're seeing with him now, how wow. how you have, uh, obviously we've talked about the handling with each of you of him, but how you're seeing, what, what you're seeing progressing-wise with Jordan Walker at the AAA level. No. For me, I, I have not seen him at all this weekend. I've been way too busy for that. So I don't know how it looks coming out of the all-star game. Uh, but for me, like he just, it, it looks good. Like we saw, I did see the, the, um, the highlight from the throw from right field. He's, he's definitely developed into a better right fielder than maybe even I thought he would be. I thought he would always be average with some level of like, sometimes he'd be above average and sometimes he'd be below average and there'd be average. And I think now he's an above average right fielder. Uh, who can flash a little bit more and then flash down average every once in a while. So I think that's a positive. I think that's maybe the takeaway here is he spent a lot of time this off season trying to become a good right fielder, a major league capable right fielder. And he's there now, uh, but now he has to make up those offensive gains. And we started to see as he, as we worked into the all-star break that he was starting to hit for a little bit more slug, a little bit more power, but he, he still is susceptible to a getting frustrated by the strike zone, uh, even with the automated strike zone, and b chasing the breaking stuff low and outside. And when he's not calm, cool, and collected, uh, when he's not in control of himself, then he gets beat because of it. But I like, I'm not. I'm even if he's not hitting for power, which is what we want to see. I'm not down on him the way that I think a lot of other people are. I just, you could tell he still isn't comfortable. He still is between who he used to be, who he wants to be, and who he needs to be. Um, and that's all just very subjective, uh, you know, uh, or I guess objective rather um, observations because he just does not always look comfortable at the plate. 
but we are seeing him evolve and get better and start to do some of the things that we saw him do at double a um it's just that he he isn't there he wasn't there and he's working to get back there yeah, we were talking earlier about some guys that were that are negatively impacted by approaches. And I think Walker is just another one of those guys. He's very aggressive, uh, a lot of chase. Uh, the pitches that he does swing inside the strike zone, there aren't the pitches that he necessarily does damage on. So I think just ironing, ironing out the approach is going to be a huge thing for Walker. I will say I think he has made improvements just in terms of consistently hitting line drives. When he was in the majors, he wasn't doing that at all. It was it was just a lot of pop outs. It was just a lot of ground balls. He's hitting he, he's hitting line drives more consistently in AAA. We we haven't seen the results yet that we'd like to see, and I don't think the Cardinals are going to promote him unless we see the results come to fruition. But there are some improvements I've just seen in terms of, like I said, the line drive ability. I think he's made improvements with his defense, as Kyle said earlier. And and yeah, I, I haven't lost hope in Walker. This kid is still immensely talented and you know i'm i'm betting on him to to be a great major league player but we're going to need to see him start to have results in triple a i also think one of the things that like, we know how talented jordan walker is he has every single talent tool you could want a guy to have uh, he's a darling of like potential um but what's really important is having a guy that you believe in as a human and knowing that he he was so bad in the field last year, like I know you guys know it, but it was like it was legitimately he didn't look like a major league player at times, um, in the outfield. To had to know that he came back and worked on it and got that much better, then like I don't know how you could not believe he's going to get better offensively. Like he's going to get to where he needs to be. It's just about like they rushed him and everyone got excited. Then he was amazing in the second half last year, at least for a twenty one year old rookie especially. Um, and they struggled this year. I I honestly kind of hope he's in AAA for the rest of the year mainly because I don't know where the at-bats are coming from, especially if they trade for this right-handed power bat, the mysterious guy who's probably going to be Kevin Pillar or someone stupid. But um, I kind of hope he just gets, stays down there. That way he can figure it out and get to where he needs to be without the pressure of we're in a pennant race and that we need you to hit home runs. Yeah, I agree. All right. Uh, so let's talk about the other darling that the Cardinals have also kind of screwed up their handling of uh, the, ev that everyone was screaming has to make the roster has to make the roster as spring training did. And then as projectively. So, and we all kind of were concerned about really, really struggled. Let's talk about Victor Scott, the second, a little bit. Um, do we still feel like he is destined to be the St. Louis Cardinals center fielder of the future? Has that soured on people? I hate to say, I didn't hate asking that question because like, let the kid develop but they didn't let the kid develop. And now I'm worried about, can we redevelop the kid? If that makes any kind of sense. I, so I'm on the outside of this one. Cause I don't know if I ever was, I was never really ready to commit to him as the heir presumptive as our good friend, Rusty Grapple used to say, I, I don't know if I was ever on that train of him being your everyday center fielder at the major leagues. I don't know if I ever really bought into that. I, I, again, I still think that potential is there, but it was not something that I like candidly, when I would talk to people uh, around baseball and uh, also uh, people like in my friends and group chats, things like that, he was a guy who I was always like, you got to trade him. If there's any value, you trade him before his, his value tanks. And part of that was because of so much of his value, so much of his value is tied into speed and defense. And there were always defensive read issues. He, he would be spectacular out in the outfield, but the reads were always weird. Uh, all of this, as I'm, as I reel myself back in was just to say that like, the mistake that they made wasn't necessarily starting him at the major league level. It was keeping him there for as long as they did. And also not sending him back to double A. Yeah, they should have just sent him back to double A. Let us get, let him get his feet wet again and then move him back up to triple A because he was, he's deceptive. Like I remember talking to Jason Hill, right? I, I was talking to Jason Hill and uh, um, uh, uh, Blake Newberry on the Viva Alberto's podcast one time. And Jason was like, well, you look at his rates, his rates are fine. Like, I I'm not really concerned about it. And that's, that's the issue is you look at the rates and you're like, oh, well, he's not striking out a lot. He's walking a decent amount and his bunting's getting better and his defense is starting to polish up a little bit. And, but like, there's just, there is an issue in his mechanics, the plate that needs to get worked out involving his lower body and what the type of contact he makes is there's a decision he has to make about the type of hitter he wants to be because right now he's four different kind of hitters wrapped into one and none of them work with each other 
Uh, so, and this is the kind of stuff that happens when you do make that jump from double A to the majors and then down to triple A. Uh, you just never really get a chance to, to even with those great, because I do think that the coaching staff, especially the, the uh, hitting coordinator, Russ Steinhorn, and all of the, the their, their hitting coaches at the minors are pretty good. There's just only so much you can do with a lack of a focus in that direction. And so that was always been an issue for me. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say they, they messed him up exactly. Um, I, I just don't know exactly what it was ever going to be and what it might be from here. Yeah, I think Victor Scott needs a change of approach. Like Kyle was saying, this is a guy that's just got five different, it, it feels like he's got so many different um, ways he attacks hitters. Like I, I just wish personally he, he just went with more of a slap hit kind of approach. Um, a lot of opposite field ground balls, things like that. Because what you look at what he's doing right now, um, he's pulling the ball a lot on the ground. And for his profile, that's just not something that's going to be sustainable for, you know, high BABIPs. You know, last year, I think he did a much better job of hitting the ball to all fields when he uh, hit ground balls. This year, he's just not doing that. Like uh, last year, he had a batting average of 300 on ground balls. This year, it's 190. And and yeah, like a lot of pulled ground balls. And when you hit pulled ground balls, like a lot of those are just not going to go for heads. I think he needs to just, like I said, go with a more slap hit approach, hit the ball to all fields. And I think we'll start to see him have more success offensively. Yeah, he he should be following the Tony Womack mold. He should like somebody needs to spit him down and be like, all right, this is who you can be. You have to commit to it, uh, especially because, you know, he has a swing and his he has good bat speed. And he he can put the ball over the fence, but he's not ever going to do it without using his lower half. It, it, like his lower half is trash. I, I hate the way he uses it in this swing. So to Kareem's point, Kareem nailed it. Dude, just slap the ball around and and work on never hitting it out into like hitting it over the heads or at the heads of the outfielders. Everything you bloop in in front of them, you get a double out of it. Uh, and then you just slap balls around. He should he needs to like we, we talk about Ozzie Smith and Jose Okendo working with the infield. He, he needs to just spend every day with, with Ozzie Smith uh, and Ozzie be like, this is how I ended up being a, a hall of famer. It was, everybody knew I was a good defensive player, but all of a sudden one day I just started hitting <laughs> and this yeah. is how I did it. And cause that's, he needs to be that kind of hitter if he wants to be a major yeah. leaguer. The thing that was frustrating to me when he was up the first time and we had, there were a lot of, writers who a lot of them I really respect so I'm not trying to like trash on them they were saying well he's hitting the ball 94 95 so and it's like well okay well what the the pitchers are doing is they're throwing him balls down the middle and they're letting him hit it directly to the center fielder every yeah. time because he's not yeah. burning any of them yeah. like they were just like please hit a fly ball like, they were like inviting exactly. him to do it and everyone was like well it, like he didn't he hit it kind of hard I'm like yeah but he does the same thing every time and you don't notice that it's not working mm -hmm. um it's like that was frustrating to me. But I, I love Victor Scott just as a personality. So I really hope he figures it out. And he also seems like a very smart kid. So I, I think he'll figure it out to some extent and at the very least be a major league player. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent, we never know. Like we just talked about Burleson. We had no idea that he was going to have this season he had. A lot of us thought Matt Carpenter doomed him to AAA for the year. So we did literally knew nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Conversely, a guy who has taken over the MLB duties in center field here in St. Louis is Michael Ciani. Oh, um geez. A guy who I, who Caleb evidently does not love. Like, yeah, we know this, true. so that's fine. I love but defense. I'm not going to lie, this is a guy that wasn't even on, like, I knew nothing about Michael Ciani. Like, that's on me. I'll own it. Whatever. But right now, <laughs> I think he's, like, profiling as the best defensive center fielder in the game. If not, he's in the top two. Um, He's hit 260 in the last whatever, whatever make up oh, an arbitrary date. I don't care. Whatever it is. Yeah, because he had two hits today. That's why. <laughs> right. Do you, do you believe that, he, that the Cardinals view him as – the center field piece, or do you feel like he is a stopgap that they would love to have as a fourth outfielder who can come in and run or who can give you a defensive replacement late in the game? Uh, all right, I guess I'll go with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think the Cardinals believe he's the long-term answer at center field. Uh, for the time being, I think it's you know a nice story, especially how he's played defensively, being the best defensive player. In, or best defensive center fielder in baseball. Like I didn't expect, I knew he was a great defender. I didn't expect to be saying that. Uh, if you told me that earlier or um, at spring training, I would have laughed at you. Like it's crazy that Michael Ciani has become this, you know, superb, you know, best defensive center fielder. Like I didn't see that, but the reality of the situation is this is a guy that has a 64 WRC plus. Um, 
he's got to do a better job hitting. I personally don't see the offensive potential in him to, for him to even be any anywhere remotely close to league average. Now, that's not to say this is a Pete Cosma or anything like that. I think he's a he's a solid player and I think a fine bench pat, but um, I, I don't think the Cardinals view, view him as a long-term answer at center field. Yeah. So if you remember, I was the one this offseason who could not believe that he made it through I the 40 man. <laughs> now keep in mind that that was, that was until Richie Palacios uh, was traded. And then that kind of changed my perspective. Cause in my mind, I was like, look, th- this is such a waste. There's 12 guys at the back of the 40 man who do not have any major league, like real future. Right. Uh, they're, they're perfectly fine uh, depth for a, six outfielders, six first basemen uh, types. And th- that's fantastic. But even even after, like, once I traded Richie Palacios, it made sense. I kept on with the bit because I love the bit. I love talking about how worthless some of these guys are, <laughs> especially the guys who didn't come from the Cardinal organization. I hold a vendetta against them uh, <laughs> with him coming from, the you know, the Reds. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind is I don't know what he did this offseason. And I know defense has always been one of his calling cards. But when the Cardinals brought him in last year, at least in Memphis, and now keep in mind some of those Triple A stadiums are weird. And even Memphis in center field's kind of weird, especially in left center. But he was he was not like the flashy outfielder that he is now. He made a lot of really bad decisions. Uh, chasing some balls uh, after some balls out in the outfield, uh, diving for stuff that he shouldn't have. He, he struggled a lot going back on the baseball. So to see him steps, whatever it was, whatever comfort level it is, it might have just been as simple as a Cardinal saying, hey, look, Here's the deal. Uh, we don't have another center fielder. We don't need your bat. We just need you to chase down everything you can. And him just buying into that. Uh, maybe that was it. But, you know, even with that defensive calling card, that I never really saw that guy last year at AAA with, with the Cardinals. Um, you know, he, like even because they called him up last year at the end of the year instead of calling up Moises Gomez. And I remember being frustrated by that in part because he wasn't even fascinating defensively. So uh, whatever happened this offseason, I love it. He's fun to watch. Uh, He is definitely a gimmick player. Like, you know, he becomes – his aura is bigger than what he is uh, because of the excitement he brings. But, uh, look, you need a a center fielder. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe if Arenado keeps hitting the way that he kind of flashed this this, uh, this weekend and uh, – you know, Goldschmidt comes around and you have all these thumping bats, then maybe you can continue to run them out there and just let whatever happens happens, especially because he and Pedro Pajes, whenever they're in the lineup and no one else is hitting, like those guys end up getting hits, which is also another stupid thing about baseball. Uh, so they like there is there is value there. But I think ideally you would want an everyday center fielder that plays a capable defensive center field uh, that can hit both righties and lefties and who doesn't make you very concerned at the plate. Yeah. It's shocker, by the way, that someone would believe that the Cardinals and the Cardinal fans would fall in love with someone who has an aura around them, but maybe isn't great at baseball. So (laughs) shocker. Who is that reference to? Hey, I'm going to let y'all fill in those blanks. I don't, I'm not throwing out. Jeremy (laughs) Hazelbaker? So I do have one. I have one last question, and then I'm going to let you all go with whatever you want to go with. But when you see the Cardinals draft two catchers early, fairly early on in the draft, I mean, whatever, whatever the numbers were, right? And then you see that they've forgotten that Herrera was one of their best hitters at the big league level, and they sent him back to Memphis to keep Pajes up there, who all of a sudden now, speaking of someone who has an aura around them that they have fallen in love with, there is another guy. No shade at no shade at Pajes, just saying. Yeah. I, I'm scared to tears that that's the guy they're wanting to deal is, is Herrera. And they've got Crooks, who's kind of soaring up a little bit. You still have Bernal down there. You've got the other guys. And then they bring in two more. Where, where do you see Herrera's, like, how he fits in with this organization? Or another catcher that I'm missing? Uh, so with uh, with Herrera in general, it seems like the market that the Cardinals are involved in at the uh, the trade deadline is mostly rentals. So I know that people will draw that straight line to Herrera and say, all right, they drafted all these catchers and you got Crooks and Bernal and then some other interesting catcher potential, uh, uh, Sammy Hernandez, uh, that they really like. But I don't I don't think it's this. It might be the offseason where you see Herrera move. Now, this organization loves Yvonne Herrera and Yadier Molina loved Yvonne Herrera. And the arm issues are weird to me because his arm has never been like super strong, but it's never been like this glaring as it was as it is right now. So. Uh, for me, I think what, you, what they're doing, what they will do, is they'll get him on a program to get that arm stronger and just see what happens. For me, 
what uh, what Campos. Now, I want to say too that for me, Cross is a first baseman. He's not a catcher, uh, and Campos is a catcher that you're hoping ends up being like Danny Jansen. I I really think that like they're like, all right, we can Danny maybe Jansen, get Danny right. Jansen if everything goes well uh, in the fourth round. So why not do that? Yeah. Um. But uh. So I I think what maybe that affects is potentially like Jimmy Crooks or uh, one of the other catchers. I I think that they're all in on Bernal. It'd be smart to be all in on Bernal. Uh, And I think that they'd be smart to be all in on Crooks too. But I just think that it it might be one of those down roster catchers that ends up getting moved in a deal to enrich their starting pitching or relief market, whatever it ends up being. I I don't think it has a direct impact on Ivan Herrera. Uh, And I will use that as my segue to tell, ask Kareem to please tell us why this is incredibly stupid, the way that they're handling Ivan Herrera. Yeah, I mean, Avon Herrera is a more valuable player to this team. I don't care. Like, the the arm strength thing, it's just overblown. Yeah. Like, I, I totally understand. Like, he's been, like, terrible in terms of just throwing out throwing out runners, bottom of the league. Like, uh, I think he's thrown out, what, three guys, and he's allowed, like, 40-something. So it's, it's something crazy. But I don't know. Like, in terms of defense, like, I don't think Herrera's been that bad outside of that. Like, I think his – um his receiving skills and um, like framing and like, I I don't think he's that bad of a defender. I think it's a little overstated. And as Kyle was saying this, like his arm strength, that was not like too much of an issue in the minor leagues. And I think this is something he'll eventually clean up. Um, His arm strength isn't the greatest. I think a big reason why he hasn't been able to throw out runners is just like the overall accuracy. Like it's a lot of bounce throws, inaccurate throws. And once he gets that under control, I think he's going to be a fine defensive catcher. And offensively, we know what he is. Like he's in terms of batted ball profile and just like exit velocity, exit velocity and stuff like that. Like he's, he's been one of the better hitters in the Cardinals, uh, uh, organization this year and and yeah like he's I, I I think without question he's a more valuable player than Pedro Pajas who like I love Pedro Pajas but I think his defense is being a little like like I was saying uh with with Herrera's arm strength I think um I think Pajas's defense has been a little overstated uh he's a good defender don't get me wrong but I don't think he's one of the better defensive catchers and I don't think you can live with the the offensive value he's going to give you so definitely think Herrera should be on this team not not to discredit Pajes I think Pajes has done a fine job and if this was you know the mid 2010s I think Pajes would be a good backup catcher for the Cardinals uh but I, I just believe Herrera is a more talented guy and he he's a more valuable player for this team right now, especially given, you know, what, what he's able to do offensively when the Cardinals need offensive help. And specifically right-handed offensive help that they really yes. need. But the thing that's also frustrating is I'll see when Yvonne was playing every day because um, Will, when Wilson got hurt and there would be three stolen bases and you'd watch all of them. And the guy would be halfway to second base before the ball even got to him. And like, Oh, that's on Yvonne. It's like, he's not the only guy that controls a running game. So that's a, I think that's a misnomer, but also like Pedro Paz has, is not like, he's not Patrick Bailey, you know, behind the plate where you're like, wow, this guy's legitimately saving us, you know, call getting us 12 strikes a game and saving us two runs by throwing guys out. He's been good back there serviceable. Like there's no problems, but it is a little bit ridiculous to have, a defensive only backup option that isn't like, you know, that spectacular. Like when is the last time you saw Pedro do something in a game where you were like, well, that really saved us. Like it doesn't, it, he's not Michael Ciani in that way, you know, just, just when he hits the home runs early on in the, you know, the, the, that was I, awesome. That Cub I, series was awesome. I maintain that the, the only <laughs> difference between Tony Cruz and Pedro Pajes is that he, Pedro Pajes has hit home runs. Uh, but hey, you know, Tony Cruz hit one off a of Madison Bumgarner in the playoffs. I was just, so I was just about ready to say that they both have had big home run moments early on in their career. And you know, I, I said it jokingly where I was like about that exact same thing about Tony Cruz and Pedro Pajes. And somebody was like, Oh, P- Pajes is way better than Cruz. And I think people forget, like, even though he was only playing like four games a year and like not even four full games, it was like. 20 innings over four games because Yachty's like, all right, I'm going to play. Sorry. I, I I just needed to go to the bathroom for three innings or whatever he was yeah. doing. Um, like Tony Cruz was this like, Oh, he can handle the staff. Oh, uh, the staff loves him. Oh, he, yeah. he's, he's a good defensive catcher and 
uh, the bat will come around. Look, there's signs in the bat, and it just never happened. I, I do think Pedro Pais, his approach is better than Cruz's was and all that. But I'm just it just to illustrate that like there's a reason why we weren't concerned about Pedro Pais being selected in the Rule Five, even though the Cardinals added him to the forty man, mm -hmm. because he like a lot of organizations have this player. And if you're talking about value, like there aren't a lot of organizations that have Avon Herrera, uh, whether it be as a catcher or as a bat or the combo of the two. So plenty of organizations have a Pedro Pajes type. Not many have an Avon Herrera type. I, Caleb has said it before, so I'm going to give him props here. Um, it does feel like Yachty ruined the Cardinals with catchers. Like they all now are looking for, well, if you're not Yachty, like then you're not, the guy and uh, it just you know now, now we're hearing that they're looking for a uh, right-handed power bat and at one point we had Fermin on the bench and then now we've got 72 lefties who are over the age of 45 and are, have, you know are getting their AARP cards and Herrera's down at AAA because now all of a sudden he can't throw guys out and it's just it, at times you guys have talked about it a lot we've Caleb and I talk about it all in here all the time the roster management not just the 40 but the 26 it's like MLB said Hey, you guys get 26. And the Cardinals said, Hey, we're good with 24. We're good with 24. <laughs> we're going to have them on the bench. We're going to bring them up, let them have a good Mo time. Said that, we're going to pay them. said that. They're, they're going to get to eat sugar fire after the games. Like, mm -hmm. it's going to be cool, but we don't need them all. We don't need them all. As Mo long as one of the said. 23 is John King, we're fine. You know what? We, we, you can have the other the other three spots. Mo, Mo literally said we, get, we had enough roster spots with 25, so we just used the other one. It's like, okay, well, maybe utilize it to your advantage. I don't know, and then you have Luke and Baker for a two-week stretch going bananas. You're like, okay, we'll call him up when he's hot maybe and see if he can give you some of that. And that never happens either. So oh. it's ridiculous. And we have four lefties batting at the bottom of the order, and then they're like, well, I wonder why we're not hitting Tyler Matzik. Well, I am I think it's because there's four lefties in a row. I don't know. It's wild. It, it is mind-numbing as well. Uh, last year, so the Cardinals at the trade deadline, obviously with sellers last year, brought in all this group. And, and overall, it seemed like uh, the consensus was they did a pretty good job with what they traded and what they got. Three guys I'm kind of interested in. If there's somebody else you want to bring up, please do that. Please. I don't want to control this conversation. But the three guys I'm kind of <laughs> – but I am interested in Sejaci Prieto and then TK Roby. Like, that felt like those were kind of the prize three that they got last year. And where, where we're standing with those three and kind of what you see is going to happen with those guys. Kyle got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so – uh Roby's been hurt all year um I had heard it was shoulder at first and then somebody told me it was elbow and I have not been able to get it uh uh squared away you know he was really he pitched really poorly when he was healthy in pitching uh so JC has had a rough year now it's been really interesting because he's actually played an okay defensive shortstop but whenever they try to move him back to like second base he's trash uh, so that's been a fun thing to watch his bat again chase heavy um a contact heavy still too at the same time relative to the chase amount. And uh, he like, he's just now over like the last month of the season, starting to show what he started showing last year about a month earlier. Uh, so I would say that he's starting to come around and at the same time, but it's the same thing with Prieto. He's a ultra aggressive, um, not ultra aggressive. He's a pretty aggressive swinger who runs into power sometimes whose third base defense is actually taking a really solid and, a positive step forward, although his second base defense is still kind of weird. And uh, again, just uh, kind of a, a hitter, kind of spreads the ball all over the place and uh, has some really interesting batted ball profile. So uh, I would say that unfortunately, Roby's injury, what's ever keeping him off the mound, although I was under the impression too that he's actually going to be back in the next month or so. Um, so we'll see about that. But um, yeah, you know, a lot of people will look at, like I had somebody de uh, text me or uh, tweet me the other day, whatever it was, and it was like, are you surprised at all that Walker or how, how disappointing is it that Walker into JC have a 240 batting average or whatever? And I, I get it. I, it's disappointing. It's not good, but keep in mind, JC still young. He's still working on stuff. He's still an aggressive swinger. And once he learns what he can do with the lower part of the plate, because that's, I'm guessing, I don't have the data, but what, I think he's a little too aggressive at the lower part of the plate with stuff that he can't actually do a lot of, a lot of damage with. And once he's learns how to work that out of his, his approach, maximize those you know go after those pitches a little bit more with two strikes instead of early in counts i think you'll start to see that that prospect thomas to jc's bat that we saw at the texas league last year uh, start to come to life 
Yeah, speaking of approach, I think Sajasi gets um, breaking ball happy a little too much. Yes. Like, like this is a guy that hammers uh, breaking balls, but I, I think, he, like, he can do a better job at adjusting it against fastballs, I think, as well. So just ironing out the approach, and obviously with a guy that's, you know, a free swinger, just, just trying to maximize just what he's able to do inside the strike zone is going to be important for him. All right, I got one last one for you guys, okay? Since the trade deadline is coming up, this is going to be a two-parter. Um, one, I w- I'm kind of concerned that teams are going to hold the Cardinals for ransom here if they try to make any move of significance. And I'm not talking about Tyler Anderson, simply because I think a lot of teams are going to say, give me one of your really good pitching prospects or talk to somebody else because we don't want anything else you have. Like, that's possible always. Um, do you think they have the prospects realistically to get a deal done without doing something that in two years we're going to say, uh oh, like they really, really messed that one up. I, I, I don't think it matters because I don't think they'll do it. I don't think you have to worry about that. I don't think this front office will do something like that. I, I you know, mm-hmm. I, you know, they're not going to outbid. We know that. Yeah. Um, especially with prospects, so it just becomes like, what are they willing to give up for Eric Fetty, uh, as opposed to whatever the other uh, uh, rental options are. So you, I don't think you have to worry about it. I do think they have the prospects to get it done. I just don't think that they'd ever be willing to part with those prospects. Yeah, I don't so see you're the saying Cardinals. Nathan Eovaldi won't be a Cardinal. That's what you're saying. <laughs> disappointing. I was going to say, just disappointing. <laughs> I, I do. I Look, I still think that there's a real chance. Uh, I, first off, I would like to get Kareem's thoughts on this too. But uh, like, um, I I think Eovaldi would be in play. Uh, like, I think he's the exact the exact thing that they'd be willing to go high end on, but you're not mm-hmm. going to, they're not going to give up Jerpy or Matthews or hence for that. Um, yeah. And if, if that's what they're hoping for, then the Cardinals will just pivot to someone else mm-hmm. uh, and they'll, they'll stay in contact and end up, you know, they're not going to give up anything. They're, they're uncomfortable giving up. I do think if Jerpy's healthy, he's the kind of guy that they would trade because they don't know how to handle him anyways. They fuck it up the whole time. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I do think that other than Jerpy, I think that those top end guys that they, they would not, trade they're not going to trade they're more valuable to the cardinals than any person they might get in in that return i think in in the cardinals mind not in my mind necessarily but in the cardinals mind and i think that we have uh years and years worth of data specifically since 2018 trade deadline 2017 trade deadline to show that the cardinals aren't going to make that move they're not going to even with mo and the position he's in they're not going to mortgage the future they just don't do it you know uh it's always been rental pitchers at the deadline, except for Montgomery. Uh, and that was the Yankees initiating that. So yeah. I think I think that's the perspective to take. Because that was kind of like the Yankees buying Bader more than the Cardinals buying Montgomery, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah it was it was it was from my understanding from the reporting, right? It was the Cardinals were approached by the Yankees about Harrison Bader. They had a surplus of pitching. Uh, and they started working around other names and other names and other names. And then they, they kind of fell in those last minutes of the trade deadline on Montgomery and Bader. Cream. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Kyle, everything he was saying. Like, I don't see the Cardinals giving up one of their top prospects or Jordan Walker. Like, I just don't see them, you know, going for a pitcher that's going to, you know, take that much capital to get. Uh, I, I see them go for someone that's that's a rental uh, maybe not the sexiest name on the market, but someone that's just going to eat up innings and, you know, be a more reliable pitcher than a guy like Andre Pallante right now. Yeah. Uh, my second part was to predict one, a pitcher that we were going to get, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I think, are you Valdi, don't you agree though? You have like the top end of what they would do. Like that's the guy where if he's like has a 2023 stretch in the playoffs, you have him in Sunday grass, pretty exciting. Um, like they're obviously not getting Garrett Crochet. That's never going to happen. Yeah, I, I without without knowing what the market is looking like or how it's going to develop, I would think that Avaldi is somebody that they would stay in touch about. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but uh, as far as like the high end, I, I still think like it's it it does it doesn't seem realistic, but it doesn't seem out of the realm of possibilities. Yeah. I, I think the one thing with with Evaldi is being down here in Rangers Astros land. The As- the Rangers right now seem to stick to what they said at the beginning of the year with they're not going to sell unless they go through like if they lose their next eight games that's going to change. But they said our goal is get to the All Star break, have a shot. They're in the, we're, they're seeing the Mariners collapse. Like the Astros have 
no pitching. I, I don't know. I'm not sold that the Rangers are going to sell. I could yeah. completely be wrong, but they sure have not have not acted like that's what they're going to do. Yeah, that could so, that could very well be a last minute thing where you know they you those they know what the value is. They know what teams want. They know what teams are willing yeah. to give up. And that that twenty third hour, they could make that decision. Absolutely. Well, had they considered well, guys, that I don't want them, that I want them to sell. Yeah. Had they considered that option. Yeah. First of all, Kareem, Kyle, thank you guys so much for coming on here. Um, I know you guys have been – it's been a whirlwind week for you guys with the draft and the All-Star game and everything else that's going on in your lives and everything. Look, so thank you for taking this hour to come and talk baseball with a couple knuckleheads like us. Uh, greatly appreciate it. We, I always feel smarter when I walk out of these podcasts when you guys are on here. Um, I, I think – with so much going on, our, our fan, like the people, Cardinal fans, are just so enamored by the draft and what's going on at the minor league system that you two, that you two are our go-to guys. So thank you so much for coming on here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Anytime, man. We'd love to have you back after the Cardinals acquire Crochet, Robert, and Brent Rooker. We will be calling you guys and having you on. So that'll be cool. Um, anyway, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we always appreciate you you uh, tuning in to us. Hey, hopefully the Cardinals, Paul Skeens, Tuesday night. If you're not doing anything, must watch TV. We're very familiar with him down here in, in LSU land. So go watch that. Go beat the Pirates. Guys, we will talk to you soon. Go Cards.